The Tempest was first performed before King James I in 1611 and was later presented in either 1612 or 1613 in celebration of the wedding of his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, to Elector Frederick V of Bohemia, a match that was designed by her father to ensure that, should she become queen in the event of her brother Charles dying before he ascended the throne, the kingdom would remain in Protestant hands. Although not written specifically for this event, the presentation of its theme of marriage as a means of cementing alliances and providing hope for future generations, and its preoccupation with the importance of virginity and chastity, would have been particularly pleasing to the king at this time. The romantic relationship between Miranda and Ferdinand plays out over Act 1, Scene 2, Act 3, Scene 1, and Act 4, Scene 1, and is very briefly shown in Act 5, Scene 1. It's not, however, the main focus of the plot, which is, of course, Prospero's quest to regain his rightful place as Duke of Milan, and to get revenge on those who have plotted against him in the past. The relationship and the future marriage is very important, however, as it has the central dramatic function of enabling Prospero to bring about a reconciliation between himself and Alonso, and to not only restore order and harmony, i.e. with the restitution of his title, but also to ensure that these endure. Because Miranda is his heir and Ferdinand is Alonso's heir, the marriage will unite the Kingdom of Naples and the Duchy of Milan, and will signal a fresh start for a new generation. The relationship plays out, therefore, in a very straightforward manner. The couple fall in love at first sight and this attachment remains unaffected throughout the play. The only challenge they briefly face is an artificial one, put in their way by Prospero as a test. And as all this takes place without the knowledge of any of the other characters, there is no one plotting to break them up for their own advantage, as in the comedy Much Ado About Nothing, for example. Miranda and Ferdinand first meet in Act 1, Scene 2, after the storm has ended, and Miranda and the audience have learned of Prospero's true position as the usurped Duke of Milan. Not only has Prospero orchestrated the storm, but he has also manipulated the way in which the king's retinue are dispersed about the island, so that Ferdinand is alone and vulnerable. Consumed by grief and charmed by Ariel's celestial music, he is brought into Miranda's presence, where Prospero actively encourages her to look at him. The fringed curtains of thine eye advance, and say what thou seest yond. Miranda is immediately struck by Ferdinand's brave or handsome form. She declares more than once in this scene that he is the most beautiful creature that she has ever seen, asserting that he must be a thing divine for nothing natural I ever saw so noble. The truth in her statement ironically says more about her innocence than Ferdinand's good looks, however. From anybody else who'd been brought up in society, this would be considered hyperbole. Her limited experience of others, however, makes this less an exaggerated opinion and more a statement of fact. Indeed, she herself acknowledges that this is the third man that e'er I saw. The way in which she adds, with no sense of irony whatsoever, that Ferdinand is the first that e'er I sighed for, is also evidence of her innocence and her confusion about feelings he has unleashed within her that she's never felt before. She seems as yet to not properly understand romantic and sexual attraction, as it goes without saying, for the audience at least, that she would hopefully not have had these feelings for either her father or for Caliban. Shakespeare also demonstrates Miranda's naivety in relation to human nature by basing her opinions of people on Renaissance Neoplatonic philosophy, i.e. that outward beauty is a reflection of inward beauty. When Prospero challenges Ferdinand's identity, character and motivations, she is quick to respond that nothing ill can dwell in such a temple. If the ill spirit have so fair a house, good things will strive to dwell with it. While her trust in Ferdinand's goodness of character is not in fact misplaced, the fallacy of this as a rule of thumb is underlined at the end of the play, when she is filled with wonder at the sight of Alonso and the rest of his retinue, including the morally bankrupt Antonio and Sebastian. I wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is! 
Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Although she shows that she is aware of the limits of her experience, she does not appear to reflect on these and so proceeds to give her heart to Ferdinand unquestioningly. Fortunately, as discussed above, because this relationship is not the focus of the plot, this lack of caution does not lead to conflict and tragedy, and the course of true love runs reasonably smoothly from start to finish. Influenced by Ariel's otherworldly music, Ferdinand is equally overcome by Miranda's beauty, claiming that she must be a goddess, and is so affected by the sight before him that he interrupts his speech with the interjection, Oh, you wonder. The effect of her beauty is such that he immediately asks if you be made or no, or whether she is unmarried and therefore a virgin, thus communicating that his interest in her is genuine. Later on in the scene, he indicates that his immediate hopes are of marriage when he exclaims, Oh, if a virgin and your affection not gone forth, I'll make you the Queen of Naples. Note that this is the second time that he has alluded to his desire for her to be pure. The importance of virginity and chastity run through the play from the very beginning, when Prospero confuses Miranda by telling her that her father is the Duke of Milan. In order to make her understand how this can be true, Prospero argues that it is possible for both he and the Duke of Milan to be her father, as they are one and the same. He does this by describing her late mother as a piece of virtue, i.e. a woman who was the epitome of chastity, who did not indulge in sexual relations with men other than her husband, who said thou wast my daughter, i.e. who assured him that his offspring were indeed his own. Note that this is all we learn of Miranda's mother, underlining the fact that a noble female's primary value lay in her chastity. I'll return to the ideas of virginity and chastity throughout this video. Ferdinand and Miranda appear to have fallen in love within the space of a few lines. We know that Prospero has contrived their meeting using magic, so how can we be sure that their love is genuine, especially as it has all happened so fast? If he has the power to direct the elements to conjure a storm and to orchestrate its effects, could he also have used magic to make them fall in love? In an aside, he is clearly pleased that his plan is working when he says, It goes on, I see, as my soul prompts it. And when he observes that, at the first sight, they have changed eyes. But he is perhaps as taken aback at the speed with which the attachment increases as we are. In another aside, he admits that they are both in either's powers, but this swift business I must uneasy make, lest too light winning make the prize light. Note the way in which he says that they are both in either's powers, with the suggestion that they are not in his, and that he is himself powerless to change the way they feel. He is also concerned that the speed of the infatuation or the swiftness of the business, will make Ferdinand's winning of his prize, i.e. Miranda, light or cheap in his eyes. Also suggesting, perhaps, that Prospero has no magical control over Ferdinand's emotions. Prospero worries that Ferdinand will think that Miranda is easy, thus threatening her virginity, which, as we discussed earlier, is her most valuable attribute. And it is this which motivates him to make the next phase of the relationship uneasy, by feigning his disapproval, imprisoning Ferdinand, and forcing him to do manual labour. We also only have to look elsewhere in the play, at the characters of Antonio and Sebastian, to know that Prospero has no magical influence over people's hearts, as they remain stubbornly unrepentant to the very end, and Prospero has to fall back on mundane blackmail to keep them in check. At the very most, therefore, we can argue that Prospero uses magic to create conditions which favour Miranda and Ferdinand's falling in love. But that is the extent of his power. The central love scene, which the literary critic Arthur Quillacooch considered the most beautiful of its kind in Shakespeare, unfolds at the beginning of Act 3, Scene 1, its purity and romance heightened by the way in which it is sandwiched between two scenes of low comedy featuring Caliban, Stefano and Trinculo. Prospero, given that he knows Ferdinand's true status as heir to the Kingdom of Naples, 
orders him to carry out the especially mean or menial task of carrying wood to test his love for Miranda. The lowly nature of this task is highlighted by the fact that he enters bearing a log, in much the same way that Caliban enters in the previous scene carrying a burden of wood. The way in which Ferdinand engages in this scene, first with his task when he believes he is alone, and then with Miranda, has echoes of the medieval literary concept of courtly love. Marriage for the noble classes in medieval times, as well as in the Elizabethan and Jacobean eras, was not about romantic love. It was instead arranged between families for political and financial purposes, and often young girls from noble families were married off to rich and powerful men who were much older than them. Take, for example, the marriage of the King of Tunis to Alonso's daughter Clarabel, whose participation in it, we understand, is more down to compliance with her father's wishes than from her own desire. This lack of romantic love amongst the highest echelons of society left a gap in the market for the writers of medieval literature, and so the concept of courtly love was born. Courtly love, with its emphasis on nobility and chivalry, comprised a set of social practices which followed an established path. A knight falls in love at first sight with a noble lady whom he worships from afar. Although she is unobtainable, usually because she is married, he nevertheless professes his undying love for her, using hyperbole and speaking in established tropes and metaphors. She, in turn, pretending to be disinterested, rejects him because she is virtuous, leading him to be overcome by the physical effects of lovesickness until such a time as he takes himself off on a series of heroic adventures and quests which he hopes will win her love. In other words, it was a romantic affair with erotic undertones that played out along established lines with the understanding that it would never be consummated. This medieval tradition had been revived in the Elizabethan era by the Virgin Queen herself as a means of gaining control through her encouragement of her courtiers to woo and flatter her, and so Shakespeare's audience would have recognised and appreciated the illusions. Francis Newman, in his book The Meaning of Courtly Love, describes it in a series of opposites as a love at once illicit and morally elevating, passionate and disciplined, humiliating and exalting, human and transcendent. And we can see echoes of all of these elements in Miranda and Ferdinand's courtship. Shakespeare uses the trope of the ardent lover in the thrall of an unobtainable female in this scene to explore one of the play's central themes, that of civilization, here embodied in Ferdinand, versus the natural world, here embodied in Miranda. Ferdinand has come from the highly sophisticated court of Naples and is well versed in the trope of the male lover as servant to the mistress of his heart. Even though Ferdinand expresses himself in artificial and somewhat hackneyed language, he nevertheless demonstrates the authenticity of his love for Miranda, through his willingness to rise to the challenge when he declares, when he is alone, that a task which would otherwise be as heavy to me as odious is made bearable by the mistress which I serve, who quickens what's dead and makes my labours pleasures. Miranda, who has been forbidden by her father to speak to Ferdinand, sneaks into his presence, unaware that her father is watching the scene unfold from a place of concealment. Note how Miranda, a child of nature and therefore ignorant of the highly artificial rules of courtly love which demand she be cold and uncompromising as her lover is humbled in front of her, allows her sweet and kind nature to immediately come through in her sympathy for him as she presses him to set the log down and rescue Love has also made her bold as she blatantly disobeys her father's orders and urges Ferdinand to stop work. My father is hard at study. Pray now, rest yourself. He's safe for these three hours. Not only does she encourage him to stop, but in a complete reversal of established gender roles of which she is also ignorant, she then also implores him, If you'll sit down, I'll bear your logs the while. Pray, give me that. I'll carry it to the pile. Ferdinand responds with conventional hyperbole. No, precious creature, I had rather crack my sinews, break my back, than you should such dishonour undergo while I sit lazy by. 
Miranda, unused to the flowery language of chivalry and its prescribed gender roles, which dictate that she be exempt from such menial labour, just doesn't get where Ferdinand is coming from, and her response is much more down to earth. It would become me as well as it does you, and I should do it with much more ease, for my good will is to it, and yours is against. As their conversation progresses, the contrast between Ferdinand's worldliness and Miranda's innocence is addressed explicitly. Ferdinand has no problem declaring that full many a lady I have eyed with best regard, yet he admits that there has always been some defect in her. In other words, he has had the intimate acquaintance of many beautiful women for whom he developed some level of attachment. There has always been some flaw in them that did quarrel with or conflicted with the noblest grace she owed and put it to the foil, i.e. the best quality they possessed, which led to his rejection of them, and it is because of this experience that he is able to conclude that Miranda is so perfect and so peerless, created of every creature's best. Miranda, on the other hand, is completely unaware of her own beauty, because she has no other woman to compare herself against. I do not know one of my sex, no woman's face remember, save from my glass, mine own. In contrast to Ferdinand, who is able to measure her against all the women of his acquaintance, it is exactly because she is skillless of, or ignorant of, how features are abroad, that she desires no companion in the world but you, as her imagination cannot form a shape besides yourself to like of. Note how even though she professes to be ignorant of the ways of the world, she knows enough to swear on her modesty, or her virginity, of her sincerity, describing it as the jewel in my dower. A dower is another word for dowry, which was the property or money brought by a bride to her husband on their marriage. Precious stones were associated with female virtuousness at the time, and for Miranda, her beauty is second to her virginity which is the most precious thing she will give him, and she reminds him of this. Even though Miranda has made it clear that she is ignorant of the language of courtly love, Ferdinand persists with the trope that he is her slave and that he must undergo a trial to win her heart. The very instant that I saw you did my heart fly to your service. There resides to make me slave to it, and for your sake am I this patient logman. Clearly Miranda is unsure of what Ferdinand is getting at and, unaware that she should be playing hard to get, she bluntly asks him for clarification. Do you love me? After a speech which begins with another courtly love affectation, that of addressing the elements rather than speaking to her directly, O oh heaven, O oh earth, bear witness to this sound, she finally gets the answer she's been waiting for. I, beyond all limit of what else of the world, do love, prize, honour you. Prospero, in an aside, demonstrates that he is finally convinced that Ferdinand's intentions are pure, and gives the union his stamp of approval. Fair encounter of two most rare affections, heavens reign grace on that which breeds between them. Clearly relieved that Ferdinand has finally professed his love in language she understands, Miranda is overcome by emotion. When Ferdinand asks her why she weeps, she responds, At mine unworthiness that dare not offer what I desire to give, and much less take what I shall die to want. Although these words are superficially innocent, they are filled with barely suppressed sexual desire, especially when we consider that, at the time, the verb die also meant to enjoy orgasm. Perhaps more than slightly concerned about these sexual undertones in her speech, Prospero ends the scene reflecting that, ere supper time, must I perform much business appertaining. He still has work to do to make sure his plan works out. He's used Miranda's sexuality as bait to lure Ferdinand, but now that it has achieved its purpose, he warns him, the next time they meet in Act 4, Scene 1, that, if thou dost break her virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered, their marriage will be doomed to suffer barren hate, sour-eyed disdain and discord. Ferdinand reassures him that no evil spirit shall ever melt mine honour into lust. 
Although Prosper accepts this with the brief, fairly spoke. He nevertheless decides to consolidate this with his conjuring of a mask as his way not only of blessing the engagement, but also of underlining the importance of Miranda's virginity, as just before the spectacle begins, and using the image of a horse which is allowed to go too fast when given a free rein, he warns Ferdinand against excessive flirting, which can get out of hand. Look thou be true, do not give dalliance too much rein. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire of the blood. Be more abstemious, or good night your vow. In the mask which follows, Iris, the goddess of the rainbow and the messenger of the gods, Ceres, the goddess of the earth and of agriculture, and Juno, queen of the gods, all make an appearance to give their blessing to the union. Noticeably absent are Venus, the goddess of love, and her son Cupid, the god of love, who are both associated not only with lust, but also with Pluto's plot to abduct Ceres' daughter Proserpina to the underworld and make her his wife. Ferdinand and Miranda make a brief reappearance in Act 5, Scene 1, after Prospero has taken pity on Alonso and his men and has released them all from the spell he has them under. For Prospero's plan to work, it's important for various reasons that Ferdinand and Miranda meet and fall in love before the former is reunited with his father, so that their relationship can be presented as a fait accompli. Ferdinand must be isolated and vulnerable so that he is even more affected by Miranda's beauty. He must also believe that his father is dead so that he is in charge of the decision relating to whom he shall marry. And Alonso must be brought to such a low point that when he is presented with the betrothed couple, the only emotions he feels are relief, joy and penitence. This is indeed the case when Prospero reveals Miranda and Ferdinand to him at a game of chess. This vignette, which, although it has echoes of medieval depictions of courtly love couples, demonstrates through their natural and spontaneous interaction, as Miranda playfully accuses him of cheating, the authenticity of their love. Sweet Lord, you play me false. No, my dearest love, I would not for the world. Yes, for a score of kingdoms you should wrangle, and I would call it fair play. As Prospero has plotted, the romantic relationship between Miranda and Ferdinand has succeeded in bringing the two former enemies together by uniting them in one family. Ferdinand spells this out to his father by explaining, She is daughter to this famous Duke of Milan, of whom so often I have heard renown, but never saw before, of whom I have received a second life, and second father this lady makes him to me. Alonso, so overcome with relief that he has not lost his adored son and heir, is immediately accepting of the relationship and reciprocates, vowing, I am hers, but oh, how oddly will it sound that I must ask my child forgiveness. In response to Gonzalo's declaration, was Milan thrust from Milan that his issue should become kings of Naples? Oh, rejoice beyond a common joy and set it down with gold on lasting pillars. Alonso gives the union his own seal of approval with the request, Give me your hands, let grief and sorrow still embrace his heart that doth not wish you joy. And just like that, the romantic relationship between Miranda and Ferdinand has served its dramatic purpose, and the focus of the play switches to the tying up of other loose ends, such as Prospero's giving Ariel his freedom, and his putting Caliban, Stefano and Trinculo back in their respective places. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.